Well, the magic hour of 11 o'clock has dawned, and so um, uh, we'll begin our uh, talk. Um, my name is uh, Patrick Dunleavy. I'm an um, emeritus professor at the LSE and uh, editor-in-chief of LSE Press, and uh, one of the sort of researchers in the Civica research uh, projects that are happening from LSE and the uh, other European universities that you see at the bottom of your screen. And uh, joining me today is Tim Monteith, who's from, um, who's a researcher on the same project working with me. And he's also a lecturer in uh, geography at UCL. And uh, Tim is a very experienced quantitative researcher and most of the uh, session will be handled by Tim. Uh, and I'm just going to kick off by uh, with some introductory slides and uh, some introductory issues that we need to think about. So when we're uh, thinking about reusing and repurposing other people's data, this is uh, typically very important for um, of people in the early career stages of their uh, work, so PhD work, um, postdoc work, um, being an early career researcher, and generally for people uh, who are not, uh, you know, receiving huge grants to do uh, very big projects. Now, of course, people receiving very big projects, uh, grants to do very big projects will also do a lot of uh, work in reusing data, but it's absolutely fundamental, really, for early career folk, and particularly for PhDs, uh, postdocs, and uh, people in the early stages of their career. But it's also very important for reusing other people's data is fundamental for the whole project of open social science. I see this <laughs> misspelling in the slide, which is apologies. Um, and uh, just to remind you, this is the uh, Turing Way diagram that we think is, is very interesting and, um, and helpful because it, it shows the many different ways in which um, having uh, people reuse data is important. So if we have people with the same data and they're doing the same analysis, then that can be important in terms of showing that research is reproducible, that it's not just the product of a single team or a single researcher's way of analyzing that data. Um, similarly, if we look down below that, um, uh, we can uh, see if, if data can be robust. Uh, so we've got the same data, but we apply different types of analysis to it. If we produce the same picture, then that gives us extra confidence in the uh, work. Another um, aspect is shown in the, in the replicable quadrant here. So this replication really occurs when we have different data but people are applying the same models, the same analysis techniques and producing consistent work. And that gives us confidence that the uh, analysis and the, and, and the data are not just the product of a single data set, but are uh, capable of being reproduced in other contexts. And finally, of course, if we have different data sets and different analysts but they're producing the same kind of results that gives us some comfort and hope that what we're getting to is generalizable social science and not just um, a particular set of phenomena uh, confined to a particular data set or a particular set of conditions so um there are two real basic types of data that people need to think about. And the first of these is what we might call reactive data. Now, a reactive data set is any data set where the information given uh, depends on the research subjects themselves responding to questions, typically in surveys, or responding to experimental stimuli. So the setup of a game in a lab, for example. 
And of course, in reactive data, the unit of analysis is always the individual person or the individual organization that's originating the response. And that creates some um, difficulties for things like if you want to extend the analysis, uh, you, uh, <clears throat> you can't uh, easily do that unless you repeat the whole survey or the whole experiment exactly in the same way. Now, there are several different kinds of reactive data, and there are different sorts of projects associated with them. The, the uh, five shown here are the most usual, usual ones. So sometimes we have a unique survey data set that's been collected by an individual researcher or team, and they have deposited themselves, perhaps in the Harvard Research Archive or something similar like that, but not in an official archive. Or, or sometimes you can get this data set uh, sent to you directly by um, uh, email, or you can find it in the article, uh, in an article annex. Um, and the problem about this is that there are no real external checks on how the researcher or team has uh, documented the data and how they've uh, deposited it. Uh, and so we get a very variable pattern with unique survey data sets. We get a little bit more confidence if somebody has deposited in, let's say, the Michigan data set or the ESRC the UK uh, data set at, uh, at Essex, because here the archive imposes and requires certain very well specified um, uh, rules to be followed. They require there to be a decent code book for the survey. They require good definitions of the variables and so on. So that usually is, is some kind of improvement if it's been through the process of being accepted for a formal research archive. Um, very similar to the unique survey data set are experimental data sets which have been created by a single team um, where people are in, you know, have been gathered in a lab and have been subject to certain procedures. Um, and certain sometimes also randomized control trials might fall under this uh, remit. And then towards the bottom of the uh, chart uh, of the slide, you can see two other kinds of um, survey based data sets that people often use and have a lot more confidence in. The first is where we have a, a single country data set series which uh, let's say, for example, in Britain, we have a British election study, which covers every single election that we have and undertakes surveys of voters and, and puts together various kinds of data uh, for each general election that occurs. And um, an interesting thing about this is that there are repeated questions which are asked across different time, time slots. Uh, and the demographics are also uh, repeated so that you can look at time series and so on. And there's always some process of consultation on questions. Sometimes it's very open and democratic, <laughs> sometimes it's not, but you still have a problem that uh, really what gets into the survey is decided by a committee and sometimes that's not necessarily uh, going to include all the things that uh, every researcher would like to see covered. Um, but at least if it's a single country data set, you know what's going on. Usually if you're researching that country, you know a lot about that country. And so you don't have so many problems in understanding, um, let's say, um, variations in the meaning of questions over time. Much more difficult is where we have cross-national concerted data sets so we're covering lots of um, uh, countries and covering lots of time periods. So repeated uh, global value studies and things of that kind. Now, there we have common question wordings that are again set by committees and may not be fully appropriate really for many of the contexts in which they're asked, but are the best common question wordings that you can come up with. And question wordings are very important for the, the things that we want to ask about 
reactive data sources. Um, if we move on to those. And really there are five questions that it's very important to think about. The first thing to think is, well, what's the relevance of this data set to the precise research question that you want to ask? How central is it going to be for your work? How important will the analysis of it be for your conclusions? What level of dependence will you have on this uh, data set uh, once your work gets started? And of course, once you sink a lot of investment in something, invest your time and effort, you really have to get it to work. So you need to think about this well in advance. Don't just plow into things thinking this will work. Really, it, you need to do some test drillings and make sure uh, that, that, that it's really going to address the phenomenon that you want. And one thing to be very careful of with any reactive data is the meaning of the variables that uh, are going to be used. So you need to critically check how closely a detailed question wording actually fits with the thing that you're interested in, or how precise demographic code or how some combination of these questions or codes is going to really help you focus on the key phenomena that you're interested in. If you are not tapping them directly, then you're usually using proxy variables. So you need to think critically about how good or imperfect a proxy they are, and you need to get lots of opinions from other people on, on that. Don't just kid yourself into thinking this will work. Um, you need to think about the limitations of the survey or the experiment in terms of who are the respondents, how many of the people are involved, or how many units or organizations are involved, what's the statistical power of the analysis. Um, so, you know, simple things like, um, <clears throat> is 50 students in a lab doing a game going to be uh, enough for you to ground in, let's say, a paper or a, a chapter on, or do you need to have more than that? Um, and uh, if you have a survey uh, that's, for example, undertaken by a particular researcher, is it big enough to generate the kinds of uh, analysis capabilities that you're looking for? It's also interesting to ask questions about the provenance of any survey or experimental data. So how carefully was it created? Uh, how much documentation do you have of the methods used? Um, what's, the, uh, what's the precise way in which this data came into being? And can you uh, have confidence in that? Or can you at least have the amount of confidence that you need for the work that you're going to do? And finally, it's worth thinking about uh, reactive data sources in terms of reputation. What is the original source of the data? How do academics basically see this person or organization? What do they think of them? Um, are they seen as biased by other tribes in the academic world? Um, so for example, let me give you an example of a, a case where Reputation is a bit of a problem. Uh, uh, in, in, in Britain, there's a, an organization called the Institute for Government, which is quite close to the British Civil Service. And it collaborated with the Blavatnik School at Oxford to produce a, a, a comparative index of civil service uh, effectiveness called In Size. Now, you know, the two reputable organizations, but unfortunately for them, the way that the index worked was that the British civil service turned out to be classified as the perfect civil service and given a 100% score and everybody else was percentaged against that. So that's automatically going to raise hackles with people. So you need to think about not just the source person or organization, but also how people critical of that source or organization might criticize the data that they've generated. Well, let's move on to the second type of data, which is non-reactive data. And non-reactive data measures are those that track the behavior of research subjects in objective terms, or, um, or they use other indices that are 
uh, fixed and that don't depend on the responses or involvement of uh, the research subjects. So this is a very potent and fast growing area of work now. And most of the social sciences, I think, are moving away from reactive measures and towards using more non-reactive data sources, um, some of which may be what, what are called unobtrusive measures, but not all non-reactive measures are unobtrusive. Sometimes people know that they're being observed, but their behavior is not you know, strictly uh, dependent on their involvement. Well, uh, again, we've got um, five types of data that are pretty important here. Um, the first one is where we have uh, a, an individual research or team that has created or put together from possibly uh, the, from their own work uh, in terms of their own computations and their own research, looking in archives or whatever, particularly important for uh, qualitative research. Um, but also uh, they may have, have drawn data from uh, different uh, sources in order to try and code up the same data about an individual or an organization that's being studied or a set of individuals and organizations being studied. So they've created the data set themselves. They've created statistics or codings. Of course, we can have lots of different kinds of data, including uh, don't have to be numerical data. And they've self-deposited this data, not in an archive. And again, either you get it in an article annex or by email, or you get it in a something like the Harvard Research uh, Deposit, which is, is not strictly uh, regulated. Um, and that can be a problem because what is going on here may be rather eclectic. It's often not very well documented. There are often just brief references to, well, we got this from somebody else and we got this from somebody else and then we put these together. And there are issues about, well, the data you got from A is for date one and the data you got from B is for date two. Is it okay to push them together and create the same uh, and, and treat them as, as being in the same year or the same context? Then we have similar kinds of data sets but deposited at a formal research archive, uh, like data archive. And these will be generally much better documented. A big uh, growth area is now downloading of social media data from the automatic programming interfaces of key firms like Twitter and Facebook. Twitter, of course, maybe not there for too much longer, we'll have to see. Um, and uh, you know you get a certain amount of data, but uh, you get it under various conditions, which are set by the firms, and uh, you get it for certain time periods. You get it for very large numbers, so you can do big data analysis. But there, there can be other issues uh, around how you use this data. And then the kinds of data that people tend to put more faith in is, firstly, administrative data produced by firms or agencies. Actually, firms or agencies are often quite flaky in how they define uh, particular indices. And so you need to be rather careful to investigate the detailed underpinnings of, of their data. But it's usually at least unambiguous and it's usually consistent and it's kept uh, consistent. And then finally, we get data from official government statistics organization national statistics offices <coughs> tends to be the best uh, defined and the most carefully consulted it also tends to last in the same way for a very long periods so it may not actually be completely relevant to the way things are operating today so you just need to think about that uh, it's high quality data but it's not necessarily very apposite data Okay, well, we, need, we can ask the same questions about non-reactive data sources as we did about reactive ones. And they, some of the things operate in the same way. Relevance for your research question is pretty much the same. Uh, and, and so you just need to think about uh, 
how much you're taking on when you start to create or to use an existing data set uh, or to add things to it. Um, really ascertaining the meaning of variables is, is very important, especially with administrative data from firms um, or from government agencies. Almost everything that's coded by a government agency doesn't mean exactly what they say it means, but some version of it, so it's some kind of proxy. So you want to really know how a behavior was defined or measured in detail. What were the accompanying contextual conditions? Because uh, objective behavior tends to fluctuate uh, quite strongly uh, depending on the situation in which it's collected. Um, how good is the demographic data? Often it's very limited and you need to think about, well, could we add in some extra uh, demographic data to identify what, what we're really interested in? Um, limitations of the data set, really the ecological factors are very important. So, you know, don't think of uh, many of these data sets as being similar to a lab study, think of them as being similar to a, a field study being undertaken by an ecologist where an awful lot of things are determined by the actual conditions on the ground and the, the timing and, and the way in which uh, things were done. Again, asking about the provenance of the data and uh, what uh, methods were used and what confidence you can have in the coding accuracy of the methods, very important. And also, particularly if you're using data from administrative data from firms or uh, agencies, uh, again, thinking about the reputation of, of the source uh, of, of the data can be very important. Well, uh, I'm going to hand over in just one tick to Tim, who's going to take you through the rest of the uh, session, and he's going to um, focus mainly on uh, quantitative data. But um, it's worth emphasizing before we do that, that uh, qualitative studies also now, there is increasing emphasis on trying to reuse information from previous qualitative studies. And these three steps are quite, quite important in finding uh, those sorts of um, uh, data sets that might work for you. Speaking to your librarians is, is very important. And if not to your librarians, also try speaking to the librarians of national libraries or national facilities um, uh, as well. Um, so don't just ask within your own university library, ask uh, librarians more widely. Ask around widely amongst researchers because there's a huge pool of information distributed. Uh, it's informal, it's not codified. Um, information about uh, not just the availability of particular questions, which is often very hard to check from outside if you're just looking at libraries or archives. Actually finding the questions and checking what they say is very important, especially in qualitative work, but also in quantitative work. Um, so researchers often have huge stocks of informal knowledge. People have often used things. Sometimes people can say, well, I tried that and it didn't work. Or sometimes people can say, I've heard that X says that so-and-so is a useful question. So you need to chat to everybody in your research team, chat to everybody in your faculty, chat to people at uh, professional conferences, and, and uh, that's a very good way. And nowadays, well, until Elon Musk took over, asking people on Twitter was a very good way of, of surface, surfacing things. And let's hope it still continues, or other social media, including your know, news feeds and, and other things. So I'll hand over now to Tim, who will carry on with the rest of the presentation, focusing on quantitative work. Tim. Yep. Thank you very much, Patrick. So, um, what I want to start with is some questions to think about um, kind of before you even start doing any research, when you're, you're, you're looking for other people's data sets or, or thinking about what that maybe you could. The first one is if you find a data set, think about what you can do with it. Think about it very broadly. But I think this question also really needs to be paired with how does this fit with me as a researcher, my research interests and my trajectories? Um, because often I found 
data sets and thought, huh, you could do that. You could do something with this or there's a question there, um, but realized, you know, maybe I'm not the best person um, to answer that question. Um, you know, you can do all sorts of interesting things, say, with some social media data, but I'm not a social media researcher. Maybe it's best to leave it to other people. I think this is really important to bear in mind um, because there is so much data out there, um, but also that reusing other people's data or repurposing it can take a lot of time, um, can be a big research project. Um, so to take that very seriously and not kind of get pulled off in too many different directions at once, um, but to, to remain focused on yourself um, and your trajectory as a researcher. How does this fit into the big picture of questions that I want to ask, answer or issues that I want to address over my long career as a researcher and think of it as building up in that way rather than, you know, maybe there's an easy win here or a quick a quick paper um, because maybe maybe that's your not best place to do it or maybe, you know, that, that won't serve you best in the long run. So before we get on to what to do with the data, I wanted to talk a little bit about finding data. I, mean, I think there are two ways of approaching this. And the first one is to think of yourself um, as an explorer. Um, really go out and start looking for what's available with an open mind, looking at data archives, talking to other researchers, searching through um, official statistics or, or kind of administrative data sets. Um, and kind of looking for things that catch your interest or that you think might be able to put foot put to a purpose rather than with a specific research question in mind. Um, and I, you know, when doing this, I'd urge, urge if you come across something interesting to download it, have an explore, see what it feels like to work with before committing too deeply on it. Um, but again, thinking bigger picture here as well, um, not just could I do something with this research question, um, you know, could I just run some variables together in regression, regression um, and get an, a nice p-value out, but think bigger picture. Okay, if I use this data set, um, how's this going to speak to other research in my field? Um, but also, you know, maybe not just this data set, but how could this data set be combined with other data sources or feed into other, other research questions or other pieces of research that I'm doing? The second way of going about finding research is kind of approaching the other way around. Um, what would your perfect data set be? Um, as Patrick said, you know, for many researchers, you don't have the big ERC grant that allows you to, to hire other people and set up the re research infrastructure to gather this data exactly as you would like it. Um, but imagine what it would be if you could. What would that data contain? How would it be collected? how exactly are you going to use it to further your research interests and your goals and analysis? Now, the thing to bear in mind there is that, that that data set isn't ever going to exist. Even if you're lucky enough to win a 5 million euro grant, um, it's not going to be the, you're not going to be able to produce the perfect data set that you want. But I think thinking about this can be helpful in that once you've got this picture that you know you want to create, you can go out and look for data sets and think, okay, well, I'm never going to, be able to recreate this perfectly, but what is out there that allows me to approximate some of these things? Or are the data sets that I can combine or bring together that allow me to address a small part of this picture? And I think this can be a, a really useful way for starting to think creatively um, about how you can reuse and repurpose other people's data set because you have an aim or a research question in mind and it's about fashioning and developing data sets that already exist towards a specific goal you have. I think the thing to, to bear in mind here is when you're thinking, okay, I'm not going to be able to recreate this perfect data set, um, what compromises can I make um, in, in terms of what's available? Um, and what is a compromise too far? You know, um, for example, is there an ambiguity in some of the questions asked that would be fatally undermining to my research? Or is it an ambiguity that I feel comfortable with and that you know I can explain in my methodology, I can address in my conclusions? And these are the kind of things you want to be thinking through 
before you commit to the hard work of actually working with that data and trying to produce a result. So with that in mind, if you found a data set that you think is interesting, what are some of the first steps in exploring that data set before you commit to working with it? I think the first thing to think of is the size of the data set. Is this a human sized data set? Um, you know, if it's a few hundred or thousand lines of data or individuals, um, I think that's effectively human sized and that it might take you a while to work through all the data, um, but it's something that you can do and something that's achievable by an individual researcher. If we're talking a data set that's got tens of thousands or millions of data points, it's something that you know isn't comprehensible um, by, by a single researcher um, and is going to need to be dealt with programmatically. Um, and think about that both in terms of your skills, but also in terms of how can you ensure the veracity of the data or that the data is what you think it is or is doing what you say it is when you, you can't inspect it uh, manually. Um, and I think that's just something to bear in mind. Secondly, um, and I guess I'm feeding into that, is how well documented is this data set? Has it been used by other researchers? Um, is it used not for research, but for other purposes? Um, and therefore have as examples or, or documentation you can draw on. Um, are the variables well explained? Um, are there neat definitions you can look up or is there someone that you can contact and look up? Um, and I'm thinking here particularly for commercial um, or administrative data. Sometimes those kind of codings for variables aren't available, but there are people who you can reach out to and ask and it's their job um, to provide you with a response. And the final one, and I think the most important one, is what's missing from the data set? Um, are the missing values? Where are they? Why are they there? Um, will these missing values affect your research? And how can they be corrected? Um, and I think this is something that applies to every data set. Um, there will be something missing from it. Um, and it's a question of like how do I deal with that in my research, either in kind of a more conceptual position when you're laying out your research questions and addressing what you're doing with the methodology or very, very practically, you know, um, a certain variable is missing for 20% of responses. Is that a problem for me when I'm reusing or repurposing this data? And then I think Finally, when, when you're, you're going through a data set and coming up with all of these things, think about the different ways in which you can work with that data set. I think when people think of quantitative research or working with kind of big data sets, they almost automatically think that we have to be doing causal kind of research, where we're looking for a causal link between a certain set of variables. We're using a standard toolbox of, say, regressions and so forth. But I think there are other options here that bear in mind. The first one that I would really stress is descriptive work. Um, and obviously, you know, this does depend on your field, but I think there's a huge <clears throat> value in bringing together data sets in a novel way to provide a description of the social world in a way in which hasn't been done before. I think there are also other things you can do when repurposing or reusing data sets in terms of predictive work, and I'm thinking here, particularly in terms of kind of machine learning methodologies um, that may not be able to, to give you that neat causal link that you would want in <clears throat> kind of more traditional quantitative work, but there may be something interesting you can do there if you're interested in exploring those kind of methodologies. And finally, is there something that you can do that's methodologically interesting or useful with that data set? You know, maybe there are too many missing values or maybe there isn't um, a research question that lines up there, but maybe you can use that data set to develop a methodology or to apply a methodological tool or to prove a methodological point. And it's just worth thinking that there are often lots of different options for how you work with a data set that can produce interesting and worthwhile research. So with all that in mind, you found a data set and you're getting to work. Um, I found, um, and I think this is very true, talking to other researchers, that data cleaning is the most time consuming 
part of working with any secondary data source. Um, even if you've got what should be nice off the shelf, um, say government statistics, there will be things that require you to clean it and adjust it. Um, as a rubric, I think you'll probably spend about 80% of your time with any data set, cleaning the data, getting the data and turning it into a form that's usable for your research. Obviously, if you've got kind of a neater, more limited statistical data set, that 80% would be much shorter than if you're working with a very large, very complex set of data. About 15% of your time will then be analyzing that data um, and kind of doing the research, so to speak. And then 5%, the very, very final bit is turning that into a research output. I think the other thing to really stress here um, is that data cleaning is the most important part of the research work here. It's often something that I think can be looked down upon or kind of seen as, as a task for, for research assistants or kind of less skilled work. But I think it's really, really important that the data is cleaned well, people understand what's happening when the data is being cleaned, because without clean, usable and reliable data, um, there isn't any research to be developed or research that can be relied on. So this is a step that's going to take up a lot of your time, but rightly so, um, because this is what everything else relies on. So making sure this is done well and done correctly um, is really, really important. So one of the things that I think is a real opportunity in terms of working with um, other data sources is the opportunity to merge data. Um, so here you're finding two data sets. Um, you find a point of convergence between the two of them and in bringing them together, you've created a new set of data from which you can create a new analysis in a way that hasn't been done before. And I think there's lots and lots of opportunities here, particularly um, with secondary data sources um, that they've been created for one purpose um, but if you find another complementary data source and you can bring them together at a point of convergence, it opens up a whole new range of research questions and avenues that you can take the research down. So this can be done with one point of convergence or say if you want um, more robust research or you know the variables might not have the accuracy that you want, you can merge data sets on multiple points of convergence to ensure that accuracy or you can bring several different data sets together to create a new data set. I think the thing to bear in mind here is that merging process can be messy and complicated so that the more you, that you're adding in in terms of points of convergence or additional data sets um, being merged into create the new data is that you're adding in extra layers of complexity. So ask yourself, you know, is this necessary? Um, to the research question that I'm pursuing um, and not just adding things in um, just because you can, um, but thinking, okay, why am I doing this to what end? Um, is it making my research and the underlying data set more robust and more reliable? And then finally, just to think slightly more technically here, when you're merging data sets, how are you doing it? Are you doing an inner kind of merge where it's the overlap between the two data sets. Um, are you merging one data set onto another? So, you know, one is still your primary data set and you're adding the other one in, or are you bringing both data sets together um, as an outer merge? That is keeping all of the elements of both data sets, even when they don't necessarily align. I think one tip to think of when you're merging data is to think that you don't have to pick just one way to do it. Um, potentially, you can go through multiple iterations of merging data sets um, to try and find as many matches between the points of convergence as possible. Um, so one way to do this is to assign unique identifiers to every data point or every row in your data before you merge. Then try all the combinations of merging. And once you've done that, use the unique identifier to bring the data, the new combined data set back down to its original size so that you're not duplicating 
any information. Um, so for an example here, I've done this with um, address data lots of times before in that one data set had one variable, which was the full address, and another data set had several different fields for addresses. Um, and through iterating through all the different combinations in which address data could be entered in the other data set, I managed to increase the match rate um, between the two data sets quite significantly, um, and therefore had a more reliable data set or a more reliable merge between the two data sets and much more data to work with. Um, another thing to think of when you're matching data is to think about matching things that are not exactly identical. Um, so this is called fuzzy matching. Um, and this can often be really useful for matching things like names and addresses things where it's human inputted data where there can be spelling mistakes or slight variations in how they've written down. Um, and this is very much about getting to know the data set and finding that what works best for, best for you or best for your data um, and kind of adjusting it by hand until you think it looks right. Um, so for example, here, just some little examples on my name. Um, if I was matching that a 94% match would be good. 50% we wouldn't want to do, but also we can we can set it so that it's matching by word. So for example, um, having my author name the other way around here provides a full match, whereas previously it would have been unmatched. Um, another thing I think that's extremely powerful, um, but something that I don't think many social scientists know about is regular expressions. Um, so regular expressions should be available in kind of any programming language you use, and they allow you to write complex text-based matches for any text input. Um, and they're very, very useful for identifying errors or specific conditions. Um, so for example, um, here, um, the kind of line of string at the top isn't very human readable, but what I've written is passed to the side, um, but after a full stop, match between one and two numbers with a colon, a space, and then a capital letter and nothing else. Um, and you can do this for all sorts of things. So you can do it from the start or the end of sentences. Um, it's really incredibly powerful um, tool to be able to learn. Um, and if you're looking at matching data sets or working with any kind of variable recoding or any form of text data, um, this can really save you a lot of time, but also allow you to do all sorts of, of matches and data cleaning exercises that you wouldn't otherwise. So for an example of bringing these two things together, um, one of the projects I worked on, we looked to match the Sunday Times Rich List, the thousands of wealthiest individuals in the UK, to charity commission data on trustees of all UK charities. Um, and this is kind of similar to what Patrick was talking about earlier. On the one hand, we have this kind of routine administrative data set from the Charities Commission. And on the other hand, the Sunday Times Rich List, um, which is perhaps not the most reliable or methodologically rigorous source, um, but it's also the best source that we have available to us um, for knowing who these ultra wealthy um, individuals in the UK are. So we made use of that and then we brought it to the charity commission data. So one thing to note is the Sunday Times Rich List, um, the name data for that is wonderful. Everything's spelt correctly, it's neatly ordered. I didn't have to do very much with it. That's not true at all for the administrative data from the charities commission where names can be put in um, basically however, however it's wanted from the individual filling out the form or the website. Um, so I made use of both fuzzy matching <clears throat> and regular expressions to clean lots of this data, take out lots of the Mr, Mrs, doctors, reverends, all that kind of thing, um, but making sure that we're not chopping out any useful information in terms of that's actually in people's names, and then fuzzy matched it um, so to allow for some slight variation in spelling mistakes or name orders or abbreviations. Um, and the result I got back got back was about 6,000 matches, um, which while a lot was enough that I could hand check them 
um, and go through and say, okay, um, you know, it's clear that this Paul Smith is the, the Paul Smith on the rich list and this Paul Smith that's on a very small local charity isn't the multi-millionaire. Um, <clears throat> so bringing in all the kind of elements that way. Another thing to think of when you're merging data sets or working um, with other people's data sets is how you can group the variables that are available to align them with other research data or other data sets. Um, so upscaling in terms of grouping up into bigger units is incredibly powerful here, um, particularly in terms of time, um, grouping things up from days to months to years makes them much more comparable with other data. And similarly with spatial units, um, grouping them up from smaller units into bigger units, um, from small administrative units, say to regions or countries, um, is a great way to be able to match that data to other data sources um, or to speak to other research literature that's out there that uses similar, similar metrics. Um, I think particularly for spatial scales, there's lots that can be done here um, if you think carefully about it and really look into it. For example, this is a hierarchical representation of all the statistical geographies in the UK. Um, it's a real mess. Um, the handbook for this, I think, is over 100 pages long explaining it. But as a researcher, it also allows you a lot of leeway to aggregate up small units into units that are comparable across different data sources. Um, this also works the other way around. Um, you can downscale um, into smaller units. Um, but the first thing you need to think about is, is this appropriate? Is it ethical? Um, would you be potentially identifying um, people in the data set um, if you were doing so um, and so on and so forth so really have a think about that because this is this can be dangerous territory in that regard um, but if it is appropriate it can also be useful um, for example you may only have one large geographical unit coded in the data set but there's other information um, in other variables that allow you to bring it down to a smaller geographical scale that allows you to do more in terms of your research or, or making it more comparable or merging to other data sets. Um, finally, infilling. Um, if there's missing data, can you reasonably make assumptions about the data? Um, so for example, if I see um, everything else in this group um, has this variable, can I reasonably assume that for the one or two that are missing? Um, could the missing data be brought in from other data sources? Um, so, for example, again, with geographic data, um, passing street names through things like OpenStreetMap can provide you with longitude or latitudes. Um, or can the missing data be estimated? Can you use statistical techniques on the data that you have available to estimate what might be missing and use things that way? Um, particularly, there's been a lot of advances here in terms of machine learning. Um, but there are techniques um, that allow you as a researcher, say semi-supervised techniques, to have quite a, a fine degree of control over that, that I think people aren't sometimes aware of, but which allows you to have a good deal of control over the results that you get. Um, and these are things to think of and, and investigate when you're working with other forms of data. So I'd like to end it there for now um, and open up to any questions that people might have. Um, so feel free to either unmute yourself and ask a question um, or if you prefer to type a question into the chat box and I will read it out and answer the question there or for me or for Patrick. Maybe I could kick off and ask you a question about, supposing we've got uh, individual level data, um, but we only have a certain uh, amount of demographics about the people uh, mm -hmm. that we've got in the, in the survey. So we know these people voted Labour, these people voted Conservative, but we've, you know, got, I don't know, two and a half thousand, three thousand of them covering the whole country, and there's a lot of variation in context that we might want to think about also. Um, 
what are the ha hassles of or the dangers of the like the ecological fallacy of, of putting in ecological or, or, or area-based data uh, to accompany the individual data yeah that's a very good question um well i think it's a question of how would this work to my research aims and what compromises am i willing to make along the way um so for example i know with kind of polling and voting data there are people that use extremely sophisticated quantitative methods to estimate all sorts of demographic details from the few details that you have and so you know this is the whole population so we can estimate you know all these kind of things from that um and it's very complex or similarly you know if you have um you know only a few data points but you have location um you can look into things like geodemographics which are used more commercially um but which are very reliable or reliable to the extent that where someone lives um, is generally determinant of the majority of their other demographic characteristics. Um, and you could say, okay, well, what can we learn from this? How could this further my argument in accepting that this is an imperfect measure, um, that these things may not describe the person that was captured in our data, um, but we know from other data sources that within this kind of smaller geographical unit, these are the majority demographic um, characteristics. Um, so again, it's it's not perfect. It's not what you want um, as the perfect data source, but it's thinking through like, okay, what's available? Could I bring it in? Is that going to undermine my research? Because maybe in some context it would be appropriate, or you know, there's a generalizable picture from doing that that speaks. To what you want to say whereas in other contexts you might think this is a generalization too far and i'm not comfortable about making that kind of the conclusion of my research well any other queries or questions it's very helpful for us if you were to ask questions so please don't feel underqualified to ask everybody's super qualified to ask the kind of questions that would help uh, <clears throat> Maybe I, was, I, can... I was just hi i've just got a question my name's veronica um, hmm. i was just wondering with the developments in cognitive science and what we're learning about how the brain works is this something we can work with in unison so that when we're approaching our research, we start to think about what's naturally happening in our brains and how we can relate that to what we're learning and what we're trying to find out in a, in a way that is um, conducive to, to, to how I'm thinking mm -hmm. at, um, to try and lead to getting a more comprehensive mm. view of the data. I think... Um... I don't know if you have an answer to this question, but I think um, it's obviously something that's interesting to think about, but I think from my understanding of kind of the cognitive and psychological sciences that lots of the research they're doing is incredibly technically complex um, when it comes to thinking about things like CAT scans or MRIs or trying to you know understand what, what's happening in, in the brain and the body. Um, and there are interesting things to be thinking about there, but I think we're a long way from being able to bring any kind of research there into kind of more mainstream social science research. I think there have been various social scientists who've lamented the fact that uh, we don't really have a systematized sort of scientific uh, way of recommending to people how to organize their thinking or organize their writing so Steven Pinker for example uh, in his book on academic writing uh, looks forward to a time where in his view um, uh, he's a psychologist 
in his view, uh, we would have a, uh, a, a sort of fully set out psychology of how to do good academic writing. Uh, I actually think this is cloud cuckoo land and that, you know, we're never really uh, going to be able to um, <clears throat> to uh, have a sort of scientific approach to thinking about data and thinking about writing and thinking about being creative and research. Um, I think there's always going to be an irremedial contextual and personal kind of uh, element that we're never going to get out of. But what we're trying to do in not just in this seminar, but in our, uh, all the seminars that we're doing for the Open Social Science Handbook, and what we're trying to do in the handbook is to take things that have been um, very important and people have discussed uh, and sometimes even researched, but uh, which remain rather informally known and, and sort of codify them. And so we're, we're systematizing things, but we're never going to systematize to the point where there's a handbook or a, an expert system that would allow you to do this in a predictable or regular way. I think that would be the, the conclusion I'd suggest. It's a really thank good question. Yeah, thank you very much. I think we've just got time for your question, Esther. We've also got one from Jenny as well. Yeah. I'll try to be quick then. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I was, I was interested in asking your, picking your brain about data cleaning mm -hmm. and, um, and how you were kind of describing um, well, one, how to take very seriously the amount of time it takes to to appropriately data clean and and what you do when you have multiple data sources uh, and uh, and you're using these to create new data. Would you say there's a cutoff point of how many sources are, are able to be handled in, in the creation of one new data set? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I don't think that there is um but i think it's a a question of kind of scale um yeah. in thinking that each new thing you add in is going to be creating a degree of complexity um and at some point that complexity is going to become overwhelming um and i think obviously you know this is very dependent on on what you're looking at in terms of your research data and your skills as a, as a researcher. Um, you know, if they're data sources that you're very, very familiar with, um, and you know, maybe they're smaller or contained or already cleaned, you can you know add in add in lots of things. Um, but if they're kind of bigger, more complex administrative data sources, adding in more than a couple of other things is probably going to start turning into this huge mess. Um, because you know there's going to be more issues around what's that point of convergence, what you're doing when it's missing, what about things that are coded wrong. Um, you're not having to deal with that just twice, but um, you know exponentially each time you add another source in. Um, and there's a similar question here from Jenny Wood um, about how to work with really big data sets when it's hard to read the data. Um, I would think things to look for are um, kind of programmatically if you're using R or Python or Stata or something like that. Um, look for all the missing values. Um, check each column for missing values, see where they're, they're missing. Um, maybe do some simple graphs. Um, like if you have a time as one variable, um, see how many missing data points there are for each year because sometimes they're just in, in kind of early years and it gets better over time, or sometimes one anonymous, anomalous year, similarly, same for different groups. Um, if there's any kind of text-based sources that are um, coded variables or um, kind of semi-coded names, that kind of thing, um, I would do kind of word count analysis um, and look at what the top things are. Um, often this will flag up kind of any issues or, you know, if they are as you see, or there's like, you know, you see Mr. Um, spelt 
five or six different times or different capitalizations or whatever lots of different times you know that if you want to filter that out um it's not it's going to be more than one um so those are the kind of things i would do early on um in terms of checking data yeah i think those are the case, best ones that was very hard to cover would you just take a random sample and uh, that's more of a sort of human size sample and just test around that yeah i often do that um i'd often yeah pick out um yeah a random sample of maybe a hundred thousand rows look and just look at them and see if they look how i think they should um similarly yeah just opening things up and scrolling through it and making sure it kind of looks right um is another good way to do it um yeah i think graphing things as much as possible just like really simple like line graphs or bar plots of different things and be like okay is this what i'm expecting um or is this graph unreadable because there's one outlier point so far away the scale's gone completely off um things like that um don't really be thinking of kind of analysis um just be kind of like throwing things at the wall um and making sure that they look sort of right to you as a researcher it's also worth i think looking for things that are more theoretically defined so sometimes there are limits to variables and you know if you if you can specify what the limit is uh then you you know um you'll be able to check so a simple example in political science is the you often have data on the size of the largest parties but you don't really have data on how many how many uh, parties there are uh, completely in the system there are theoretical limits to how many parties there can be in the system given you know a certain larger size uh, the largest parties are of a certain size so you can check to see if things fall outside the limits and that's a very good example a quick way of finding miscodes yeah uh, yeah, yeah yeah just to follow up yeah patrick made a very good point that yeah checking minimums maximums um just the distribution of variables um you know, is it falling towards a standard distribution <laughs> that i would expect or is it another distribution um kind of i think there's a lot of intuition um on the part of the researcher there but you know as patrick said also asking around with other researchers okay have you worked with election data um does this look right to you um are the things that i should look out for here there's also a question from irma i don't know if you can see it uh um, yeah just reading that now she asks if you use non-reactive data twitter api data acquisition but it's a data set from someone else from a github page already published in another journal currently i'm using this two billion data <laughs> In your data cleaning prep steps, it's a mix of merging and have another purpose for that. Uh, what do you think about that? Um, well, that's a lot of data points. Um, it's very difficult. I think when you have so many data points, um, yeah, I think you, you're probably already already doing a lot there um, and already. Um, Take it, take on what's the steps that I've suggested. I think when it's so many, you kind of also got to take on board that you're not going to catch everything. Um, there are going to be things that fall through um, simply by the sheer size of the data. Um, and to think potentially more conceptually about how this will affect or could affect your analysis um, in terms of what's a almost like a reasonable rate of error or, or kind of you know how think, thinking okay it's never going to be perfect i'm never going to catch everything but what does that mean for my analysis um and kind of what i can do with the data what i can conclude with it patrick do you have any thoughts there yes. well the, the, oh, the yeah. various the very obvious question uh issue with something like this is that uh, if you have that much data then things like you know uh p values and significance testing just collapse away everything is significant whatever you do um and there's an interesting article by Hal Varian who's the chief or was the chief economist at uh, Google uh 
where he recommends, you know, that you deal with this by, for example, partitioning uh, the data into, well, let's say, in this case, 10 different data sets, uh, just randomly assign things to them and then test different models on, on different data sets and see which ones are, 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 are working because you can't use significance values and P values just, you know, everything will be significant. You could put in the most bizarre things and with 2 billion data points, you'll, you'll get, uh, you'll get to. Uh, Can I ask again? So the data set was like from 170 more countries. So maybe if you say it about the partitioning, I would like to do it in my language. I'm from Indonesia, so I speak Indonesian. So in in my PhD research, I think the idea was trying to find a pattern first. It's a COVID, uh, it's a COVID text. So the 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 data is for uh, they they collected a lot of tweets, obviously, but they have geolocation data set. So they have every uh, country. So if you are, if you thank you for your your idea. So I, the partitioning is is a is a really good idea. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it sounds like a really uh, marvelous data set, but but quite tricky to handle. So be you know just uh, you'll need to take it carefully. Um. Well, we're at uh, 12 minutes past, uh, uh, nine minutes past 12. So uh, I think we should uh, draw things to a close. If anybody wants to send us uh, email inquiries and, or, or other uh, things that we can respond to, we'll, we'll be happy to uh, look at those. Thank you all very much for coming. Many thanks to Tim for a very, very clear, very uh, helpful account. And uh, we'll be doing another one, Tim, in a couple of weeks time on something yes um it's still to be advertised i think we need to figure out the exact date for that but yes please come along to our next one we will send you an email about it and uh, we'll be doing uh you know four or five or six more uh after after christmas so i think the next one is our last one before christmas uh, but we'll be advertising that through the civ connect thank you very much for coming and uh, good luck with your researches thank you Cheerio. goodbye Bye.